So today for this learning lunch, we're going to learn about and celebrate the many amazing pollinators of our neighborhoods and open spaces. I, can, I hope that you can join me in applauding these amazing buzzing and bustling denizens of our local open spaces. Um, my name is Kat. Um, I am the volunteer programs coordinator with the Open Space Authority, whose mission it is to protect water, wildlife, working lands, and welcoming people to nature. Um, I will give you a little, uh, I guess, um, caution is I am not an entomologist, uh, but I am certainly an enthusiast of a bunch of these really neat pollinators. So if you have questions, I might not have the answer to them, but that's okay. I also have tons of resources behind me and I'm sure that we can find out the answers together. So like I said, this is a presentation all about pollinators. We're gonna sit and celebrate, um, learn a little bit about some of the local pollinators in our neighborhoods, in our gardens and in our open spaces. Here we go. Here's the thing. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to make sure that we acknowledge that the Open Space Authority and all of us in the um, in the Bay Area, we work within lands that were originally stewarded by the Oswaswas, Chochenyo, Mutsun, and Taman-speaking peoples. And today we are honored to get to partner with the Amamutsun Tribal Band and the Muwekma Ohlone Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area in our shared work to protect and um, restore the environment and connect people to nature. Um, we're really happy to get to partner with local tribes and learn a bit more about the practices that protect these really neat um, ecosystems and these pollinators that we're going to talk about today. I also wanted to give a special thank you to all of the volunteers who let me use their photographs in this presentation. This was a bit of a crowdsourcing effort. Um, a lot of our volunteers work in these open spaces. They also work in other local parks and um, other places. They help to educate. And so they were so kind to share their photographs with me. All of those photographs are uh, labeled with the names and stuff. So if you ever want to find out who took that amazing picture, um, you can come back and watch this um, recording and see that as well. So let's get started with this pollinator party. And I'm gonna ask or you know, consider a very basic question before we get started. Um, what is a pollinator? Well, a pollinator is an animal, usually, that moves pollen from the male parts of a flower or the anthers to the female parts of a flower called the stigma. This is how um, flowering plants um, have sex. It's how they move their genes throughout the population and um, reproduce. So the driving force for the evolution of pollinators is really that insect pollination is very efficient. Um, it's more efficient than it is by wind and water. We have uh, a lot of plants around us, uh, many trees and grass species that put out tons of pollen, especially in the springtime, um, in order for the, for the luck of the draw um, to get, um, to basically get from individuals to other individuals in the same species or population. It's kind of, you know, um, the more 
that you put out there, the more likely you are to succeed. Whereas with a pollinator, with an animal pollinator, you are much more likely to um, get that pollen to an, uh, another individual of the, of the same species without necessarily having to put out so much pollen. Um, so it's a lot more efficient. And what do the animals get out of this? Well, they get nectar often. They also get pollen resources. Um, many, many of these organisms actually use pollen um, for consumption as well. And we'll get to talk about that. Um, and also they form very specialist relationships with plants um, in terms of how they support each other in the ecosystem. Um, pollinators often fly, they have hairy bodies, they specialize in getting these different resources. Um, they're also incredibly diverse. There's over, there's about 350,000 species of pollinators known worldwide. And these include insects, they include reptiles, they include birds, they even include mammals. Here in California, for example, we actually have bats serving as pollinators for agave and cactus in the southern deserts. And here in the Santa Clara Valley, we have a multitude of different uh, pollinators that, um, that serve our local ecosystems. That includes things like hoverflies and hummingbirds and beetles and ants even are considered at least incidental pollinators. You can see this little ant down here with the pollen on them. I think it's so cute. So that actually brings me to understanding why do we need pollinators? Well, because they assist in plant reproduction, they help support biodiversity. Um, they can spread these genes through populations, which reduces bottlenecking, where certain segments of the population, they could diverge and become another species, or um, they might not survive because they just don't have um, genes flowing from the rest of the population. Um, plants serve these basis of our ecosystems and over 80% of our flowering plants actually require pollination of some kind through different organisms. This diversity in plants means diversity in insects and other foods upon which even more organisms um, rely on. So pollinators are a keystone species. Um, they are very important to our local ecosystems. It's also important to note that we need a diversity of pollinators in these ecosystems because if one pollinator somehow fails or isn't around anymore, we have others that can still fill that niche. Um, it's, you know, like it's really important to realize like we can't just use one kind of pollinator in order to, um, save or, or protect all of these different plant species. Um, many plants have specialists that have um, really specific relationships with certain organisms. Like for example, many native bees have the specific relationship. So you can't, it's not a one size fits all kind of deal either. In addition to being vital for biodiversity, pollinators also support many benefits that humans receive for healthy ecosystems, like most notably food security. Um, it is said that one out of every three bites of our food is created through pollination. So this is incredibly important to have um, and in order to help people survive as well. <clears throat> And I'm glad that we are starting to see some questions pop up in the Q&A, and I will certainly get to those questions at the very end. So I appreciate you starting to get that rolling. I'll do a double check. Ha, huh. cool. So 
as we start our party today, I am going to go around the room and introduce you to some of our most notable attendees. Within the Santa Clara Valley, we have an array of fuzzy, feathered, crawling, and buzzing, and pollen-carrying friends that do an amazingly important job in our local ecosystems. And we're gonna first start off with, um, hold on. Why is it not working? Just give me a minute. There's just a little bit of technical difficulty. Huh. Oh, it's behind that. No wonder. Sometimes the little icon appears and sometimes it doesn't. Come on. Oh, there we go. Cool. We're going to first start off with beetles. So beetles are pretty neat because they are some of our earliest pollinators, some of the earliest um, flowering plants uh, used beetles to visit those, those flowers. And they actually remain very essential pollinators today. They are still really important pollinators for species such as magnolias and a uh, spice bush, which are really old lineages of flowering plants. Um, super neat is like beetles kind of have specific plants that they really like to visit. Uh, they like these bowl shaped flowers um, with a, <clears throat> the nectaries exposed. They like flowers that are white or dull or white or green. Um, they like really strong smelling flowers um, that are open during the day. And they love nectar. They really like nectar. Um, I often see uh, beetles in flowers such as our local calicordis or mariposa lilies. Um, and those are going to just start to bloom within the next month or so. So when you are outside, looking in you know your local parks and open spaces keep an eye out for the yellow mariposa lilies the white mariposas um, these are good places to find beetles and as you can tell they love these mariposa lilies because they have these little um the mariposa lilies have these little nectaries or like um, nectar pockets um, at the very base of the petals. And it's just a great place for them to hang out and sip and maybe uh, meet others in their own species. Uh, it's amazing. I also have a picture here of a green blister beetle, which I'm not sure if they are gathering. Well, I'm pretty sure they're not gathering any resources because California poppies don't produce nectar. So likely, this little beetle is um, hanging out, just trying to seek shelter from what was a really cold day. Um, but these are really neat. I highly recommend checking this out. Speaking of mariposas, um, we're going to talk about butterflies. So mariposa is Spanish for butterfly, and mariposa lilies are named because of their intricate patterns, such as very similar to what a butterfly wing might look like. Um, so we're gonna talk about Lepidoptera, which is the family that includes butterflies and moths. Lepidoptera literally means um, scale wing. So it speaks for the little tiny colorful scales that cover the body um, and the wings of um, this particular group of organisms. Butterflies and moths are incredibly diverse, but they hold several things in common. They have those scales, like I mentioned. Um, they undergo complete metamorphosis. So they have a larval form, like a caterpillar, that goes through a chrysalis or a pupa, 
and then they emerge through complete metamorphosis into this almost completely different looking organism. Um, members of the family in Lepidoptera are very good pollinators. Those scales and those fuzzy hairs on their bodies are really good for carrying pollen. They are also, um, they form very specialized relationships with native plants. Many of the larval forms of these butterflies um, can only eat a certain type of plant. So a really good example is say the monarch, which needs milkweed. Um, it won't eat anything else during its larval phase. So having milkweed around is very important to supporting monarch populations. Um, another example may be the bay checker spot butterfly, which is a local species um, in the Bay Area, almost found, only found in on uh, Mayanu Yakima Coyote Ridge Open Space Preserve. And it needs dwarf plantain, which is a very tiny little plant that seems to only grow in rocky and um, low nutrient places. So these are like really incredibly important pollinators. Um, they also help us see the relationships between pollinators and everything else, the plants on the on the landscape. And I can't talk about butterflies without mentioning moths. Um, <clears throat> when the butterflies go to sleep and when the bees go to sleep and when those hummingbirds go to sleep, the moths are still around. And um, moths are basically the night shift and they are the night life. They are important pollinators because they often take over to continue pollinating flowers that do not close during the night. <clears throat> there are also some flowers that attract moths specifically by only opening during the night or having very heavily scented flowers that attract them. Um, moths have been known to fly longer distances than bees. Um, they're like the marathon runners that transport pollen and plant genes even further distances than bees do. Um, this ensures better genetic crossover and more biodiversity. Then their fuzzy little bodies carry a lot of pollen. Um, some moths, um, I don't have it featured here, but the there's a very particular species of moth in Southern California that has a very special relationship with the yucca, for, for instance. And the yucca moth actually, um, it pollinates the, the a lot of different yucca plants, but primarily Joshua trees. And so the Joshua tree really needs this moth because only this moth can do that pollination service. And the moth actually needs the tree because it lays its eggs and the larvae eat um, the seeds that are produced afterwards. So there's a very symbiotic relationship between the yucca moth and the Joshua tree. Um, and so this is just another example of a very particular relationship that happens with these different pollinators. All of these pollinators uh, are ones that you can find around here. That includes the white line sphinx moth, the silver spotted tiger moth, the Pacific green sphinx, um, but, you know, I don't want to pigeonhole moths into one um, particular uh, time of day or, or form because we actually have a really neat um, type of moth called the fairy longhorn moth um, within, within the Bay Area. And they're somewhat rare. Um, I only find these in particular areas with uh, certain plants nearby, but they're diurnal. 
So they don't necessarily fit the, oh, moths are only at night. They're a diurnal moth. They also don't have those like club-like um, antennae. They actually have quite long antennae, almost three or four times the length of their bodies. Um, this is primarily the males that have this, by the way. I don't think the females have that. Um, and then the other thing is like, you know, most moths are fairly drab, but these are actually quite beautiful. You can see their metallic coloration on the wings. Um, they're actually not very big. They're basically a few millimeters um, in size. Um, the antennae really give them away, I think. Um, they're kind of goofy looking. And I sometimes wonder exactly how they fly. I don't think I've ever observed one in flight. Um, but they are one of my favorites uh, because they also kind of signify this particular relationship. Um, they are they they basically um, forage around and I think use uh, cream cups for um, as their source, and so they're mostly found in serpentine areas and in in areas with those cream cups. Um, they were really neat to see. I love them. I love to get to see these. And that actually brings me to a really um, big group of organisms. And so I'm gonna actually take a pause here um, for bees, um, just to tell you a few things about bees in general before I do kind of more of a deep dive on bee diversity because um, uh, you'll you'll have your mind blown with the next slide. Um, so here's a couple of general things um, to mention about bees. Bees um, are actually evolved from wasps. Um, so bees are in fact, they're vegetarian wasps. Um, they feed their developing larvae pollen um, which is their protein source. Um, a wasp will go after some kind of meat, some kind of protein, and usually that's them hunting another insect or in the case of yellow jackets, them bothering people for lunch scraps, you know. Um, but bees are really, really efficient pollinators because they are actually purposefully collecting pollen. Um, they purposely go to flowers to collect pollen to make um, food um, and pollen stores for their larvae to eat so that their larvae can develop and turn into bees. Um, the other thing to mention, not all bees sting. It's really um, important to remember that most bees the vast majority of bees are solitary bees. They don't sting. Um, and most of them don't want to sting. Um, the one that I think gets the rap for stinging is our European honeybee, which isn't, you know, it isn't even a native bee. Um, and most of our native bees don't sting. The bees here in California are crazy diverse. Um, California is a global hotspot with about 1,600 native bee species. Pinnacles National Park, just south of us in the Bay Area, is actually has actually one of the highest densities of native bee species in the entire United States and probably the world. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to give you you know, a little taste of some of this diversity, but please go outside, meet and admire some of these amazing, beautiful bees and know that um, I cannot do it justice here. They, they really need their own presentation. Um, but yeah, I love this picture. This is from David Mock. Um, he's got this 
crazy eyes just looking at you. So yeah, these are just a few of the bees that you might find in our local area. Um, we have the Western honeybee, which I'm, I wanna talk about a little bit. Um, we have so next to that, to the side is the male valley carpenter bee. We also have, you know, we have both males and females, but important to note is they have a lot of sexual dimorphism. So males look like these cute little teddy bears. Um, with green eyes. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a picture of another type of carpenter bee, the foothill carpenter bee. Um, we have sweat bees. We have down here with the, uh, I think that's a cactus flower. Um, that's a chimney bee or didasia. There's uh, digger bees, there's bumblebees, there's mining bees. There's masked bees, there's wool carter bees, there's resin bees. Um, there's so many bees. Um, it's again, really important to remember that 90% of all native bees are solitary, um, very different than what we kind of associate with um, bees in general, that they form hives and they have honey. That is, in fact, only something that we get with our Western honeybee, um, the Western European honeybee, um, which I do want to mention. Um, the Western European honeybee is uh, an introduced species, and it's not native to the United States. It is the only bee that is used to commercially make honey. And it's a very social insect um, that organizes a hive of workers around a queen. It's really important to know like that's the fact that they're creating a resource and um, they have a hive and a queen and this resource to protect means that they they sting they have this protective this means of protection um honeybees um according to a lot of different ecologists are not as effective as pollinators as other species of bees because they are more generalist. Um, they go after and use just about anything on the landscape, which means um, the efforts of collecting pollen among this, th these different plants are diluted. Um, many of our native bees are actually much better pollinators because they favor certain types of plants and certain types of flowers which again means that those plants are more likely to get pollinated and to mix pollen with um, species of their own, like their own species, individuals of their own species. So um, the fact that like bumblebees, you know, have a certain way of uh, pollinating and they tend to pollinate certain plants means that they will kind of, you know, go to the individuals of the same species more so than say a honeybee will. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that of these different types of bees, they also make so many different kinds of structures. The honeybee, you know, they have, they tend to nest um, in cavities and they'll make um, honeycomb and use that for their structure. But many native bees, they actually make their nests in the ground. Some make their nests in wood, like the valley carpenter and the foothill carpenter bees. Um, others like to cut little circles out of leaves to separate the chambers in their, in their nest, like the leaf cutter bee. Others gather fibers. So they can go out and they'll, they'll capture fibers in order to line their nests. Those are wool carters. Um, some even chew up plant resin in order to make their nests. Um, and then even more bees, like not even featured on here, um, even there are even other kinds of bees that actually um, don't collect pollen at all. Um, 
and they actually have a parasitic relationship with many of these bees, and those are called cuckoo bees. So like the cuckoo bird, um, cuckoo bees will try to lay their egg in the nest of another type of bee. Um, they usually have a very specific host. So bumblebees often have their own cuckoo bees. Sweat bees have their own um, cuckoo bees, et cetera. And they'll lay their egg in that nest and that larvae will hatch sooner and eat the pollen stores and or the larvae of that original host. So the world of bees is absolutely fascinating and diverse and crazy, just full of theater and drama. It's fantastic. And I highly recommend that you get outside and take a closer look at what you might have in your local parks and gardens. Um, I do wanna demonstrate just one example of the special relationship between bees and plants. And so I'm going to tell you, or actually show you, um, one bee's very special superpower. And actually, I think what I'm gonna do is I wanna make sure that the sound is on for this. So I'm gonna stop share real quick. And just bear with me. Cool. Put that back up. And display settings. Go here. But let me let me go back to sharing my screen real quick. No, oh, hold on. I didn't get that right. Um, optimize for video clip. There we go. Share. There we go. Do that again. All right, hopefully everyone sees that. And hopefully you all can hear this because I made sure to reshare it so that the sound would work. So bees, especially bumblebees are musicians. Um, they are in fact capable of a very special ability called buzz pollination. And so I'm going to let PBS and KQED um, Deep Look show you a little bit more about this because it's absolutely amazing. This buzzing is a secret password, the key to a lock. What this bumblebee is after is pollen. Bumblebees eat pollen. It's high in protein. But the flower doesn't want to give it to just anyone. So it hides it away in those bright yellow anthers. For a flower, that's unusual. Most flowers keep their pollen on the outside of the anther, which is the male part of the flower. Pollen is basically sperm for plants. Most flowers make sugary nectar, too. They use it as bait to attract bees and other pollinators, which get coated in pollen along the way. And since bees are messy, they inadvertently scatter some of that pollen onto the female part of the next flower they visit. That's how most flowers have sex. But this type of flower doesn't offer nectar. The only way to get to its pollen is through those tiny pores at the ends. But the bumblebee knows just what to do. It wraps its legs around the flower and bites down on the anthers, that male part of the flower. 
See those wings shaking? Normally, the bumblebee uses those powerful muscles to flap its wings. That's what makes the buzzing sound when they fly. But here, those muscles vibrate its whole body. So hard and fast that it makes a louder, higher-pitched buzz. This vibration shakes up the pollen trapped inside the anthers until it spews out all over the bumblebee. It's called buzz pollination, and you don't need a bumblebee to do it. A tuning fork will do. The bumblebee grooms the pollen down into sticky sacks on its legs, carries it back to the hive. Only a few types of pollinators, like bumblebees, are capable of buzz pollination. Honeybees can't do it. This field is kind of a free-for-all. Think Las Vegas buffet. Tons of food, but long lines. Lots of competition. Buzz pollination is more like a private club. By only permitting pollinators that know the secret knock, the flower ups the chances that its pollen will end up on flowers from the same club, the same species. The bumblebee? Well, sure, it has to work a little harder, and there's no sweet nectar. But it's a reliable pollen stash that almost no one else has access to. Tomatoes, potatoes, blueberries. All of these need buzz pollination to reproduce. Much of the food we eat owes its existence to that buzz. Our secret password. So that one was such a cool video. Um, I personally love the fact that they describe it as like this this kind of club and that's exactly what this specialized um, ability means for different plants and and different bees um, some plants can only be pollinated uh, through buzz po pollination um, and other uh, species of plants um, are only pollinated by you know certain types of native bees so it's from important to remember some of these really specialized relationships and some of the things that we as people get to benefit from as a result of that. So we're here at Deep Look. Oh. I'll be honest. I, I just want to, there we go. Cool. So again, bees, they can be their own presentation. Um, and I highly recommend that you do, you know, some research and get outside and take a look at some of our native bees because they are absolutely beautiful and amazing to behold. Um, but a very similar and just as important native pollinator includes wasps. Um, wasps actually get a bad rap because they include things such as yellow jackets. Um, but it's really important to note that the vast majority of like wasp species are nectar-seeking uh, pollinating wasps that do not necessarily go out of their way to like sting people or mess up their picnics. Um, they actually do need to go after meat sources. Wasps are carnivorous, and um, but the majority of them actually go after other insects in order to feed their young. Um, most important thing to remember is that like the young, um, the larval forms of both bees and wasps need protein. They need to have a protein source in order to develop. And so bees actually get that through pollen. Um, wasps actually get that through their parents hunting other insects. Um, so wasps are actually really good um they're really good insect control so if you're looking for things to help uh, protect against pests in your garden like caterpillars or aphids wasps are actually a very natural form of insect control 
um, they help to keep those populations in check. Um, they are also, I might say, some of the most intelligent arthropods um, on, this, on this earth. Um, as a predator, um, and I think you, this kind of is a, a good thing to say about a lot of predators, is they are more intelligent than, say, other organisms within their class. And um, wasps are actually intelligent enough that they can recognize each other's faces. So um, they, they kind of have their own social dynamics and they are actually very good parents um, in terms of providing for their young. So they definitely earn our respect. And I will say, uh, like, we definitely don't want to overlook some of the maybe lesser known pollinators in our gardens. Um, that includes the wannabes or the flies. Um, there are certain species of flies that are wonderfully good pollinators, and it actually comes as a part of their mimicry for bees and wasps. Um, like a practical jokester, flies can mimic a bee or a wasp by having bright colors and buzzing movements. And this actually fools different predators into thinking that this fly is gonna sting them when in fact it won't. Um, a fly's disguise, however, is not so hard to figure out, at least for us. Um, flies have only one pair of wings, whereas a bee or a wasp, they have two pairs of wings. Flies also have these really big uh, compound eyes. So it's very easy for us to tell, but you know, not so much for the birds and the lizards and other things that might eat them. And there are some species of flies that have actually evolved really fuzzy bodies um, and a really long tongue. There's a really good picture of it here, um, this bee fly. And I, oh, you know what? I don't think that one showed up. That's from Marav Von Schack. Anyway, um, so that bee fly is a really good example of like having lots of hairs that can then um, have lots of pollen stick to it. They also have this really long tongue um, that can, um, you know, probe and get at nectar um, in hard to reach places. Um, these are also really important pest control um, types of insects as well, because the larval form for some of these um, flower flies or bee flies actually eat aphids and midges and other things that might be bad in your garden. So welcome the flies. They're amazing. They should definitely be invited to the party. And last but not least, uh, I definitely wanted to give a shout out to hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds are another amazing type of pollinator. They definitely add drama and theater to the pollinator party. Um, they are specialists on colorful and tubular shaped flowers. They actually have this very straw-like tongue that they can use for sipping nectar. And this helps them fuel their extremely fast metabolism. Um, here in the Bay Area, we get a wide range of hummingbirds, including Annas, Rufus, Allens, Calliope, um, Costas, and so many more, um, especially as migrants. Um, hummingbird migration is amazing. They can travel thousands of miles um, up and down the coast and in the mountains um, to get to where they need to go in order to breed. Um, so they're absolutely amazing. Um, the residents that you are most likely to see are actually um, Anna's hummingbirds. And I believe that these are all pictures of Anna's hummingbirds and someone else can correct me because I'm not, I'm not a specialist on hummingbirds, but they're so cool looking. And with all the different types of pollinators that we've seen having a good time at our party today, 
Like it's really hard to imagine them having too many threats, but in fact, many of them do. There are several pollinator species that have seen extreme dips in their populations, including the monarch butterfly, um, which is still considered threatened um, in California due to recent drops in their population. Um, many types of native bees are considered rare and threatened um, because of um, loss of habitat. Um, but there are many more um, pollinators, especially insects, wasps, flies, native bees, that we don't know that much about because they're not as charismatic as some of our larger organisms. So it's very hard to quantify their loss when we really just don't know. Um, some of the things that we think are um, threatening pollinator habitat and pollinator populations include pesticides, um, loss of habitat, um, parasites and disease, um, as well as climate change. But there are a few things that we can do even here at home to help these pollinators. Um, we can protect habitat. First off, protecting um, local open space where habitat already exists is uh, some of the most important things that we can do for our local pollinators because um, we don't have to do the work of restoring areas. We just protect it the way it is. We can ensure that those resources are there for them. We can also protect that habitat and make sure that it exists within our own yards. Um, some of the very basic things that you can do in your yard include like keeping standing twigs, um, leaving leaf litter, as well as patches of bare ground. Um, certain bees need bare ground in order to build their burrows. Others live in the leaf litter in order to um, survive the winter and some even overwinter in um, hollowed out twigs. Um, you wanna be pesticide free. Um, even though there are pesticides out there that are very targeted, um, many of them still have impacts for um, especially insect populations and it can have a cascading effect um, through things in your garden. So you wanna use, um, be, you know, you want to be pesticide free. Um, the other thing is planting native plants. As I mentioned so many times throughout this presentation, um, native bees, especially, and all kinds of other native pollinators, they have a, they have certain relationships with the native plants um, in our area. So if we plant those native plants um, and we have those in existence, we can. Um, help them flourish. Um, if you don't have a yard or you don't have access to one, like there are ways to volunteer in your local community in order to help pollinators. Um, you can volunteer to help in restoration projects. Um, the Open Space Authority has several restoration um, projects in progress right now where we have planted native plants and we need help with um, keeping them maintained, at least until those native plants are well established. And so we need volunteers to help us clear out invasive weeds and um, to help with irrigation and, and things like that. So come volunteer with us um, or come volunteer with other organizations in the area. The very last thing that I might add is that you can participate in community science projects. And one of the things that is hindering our abilities to protect pollinators is lack of knowledge. Um, and so helping by joining a community science project, getting on iNaturalist and submitting reports of pollinators that you see can help us document uh, what's out there. So, that mostly wraps up my presentation. I did want to share a few um, resources for everyone. Um, awesome, I have 10 minutes to go, so this is great. Um, just a few resources. Um, 
These include the Xerxes Society is probably one of the best sources for finding out about local pollinators and finding out how to um, restore habitat in your area. They also have sponsored a really cool project called the California Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and so you can volunteer for that project and learn how to survey for native bumblebees in California. There's also the Monarch Milkweed Mapper, which um, is helping to document and understand the decline in the Western monarch population. Um, and so you can submit observations of monarchs and milkweed um, to that project. Um, there is the BioBlitz Club, which is an amazing local resource. Um, if you want to learn more about, especially about invertebrates, um, the founder, Mara Vonshak, is absolutely amazing, and I highly recommend joining for one of their BioBlitzes and getting on iNaturalist and just submitting things because they're very helpful. Um, other resources to consider might be the California Native Plant Society. You can learn a little bit more about uh, the native plants and the species that they support. You can also learn more about hummingbirds with the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And you can join us. You can come out and volunteer with us um, to help restore habitat and support native pollinators with the Open Space Authority. And if you're interested in coming to volunteer, I highly recommend that you email me. Um, I have my contact information on this slide. Um, lastly, I did also want to invite you all. Um, the Santa Clara County Parks um, is going to have a pollinator day at Marshall Cottle. Um, <clears throat> and so, and that's going to be on June 24th. There's going to be a guided walk as well as pollinator related activities. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about pollinators or interested in learning more about local organizations to support pollinators, um, this is supposed to be a really fun and family friendly event. Um, it's from nine to 11 and yeah, that's amazing. So I am going to stop share if I can figure out there we go stop share oh there's Michelle hello that was so cool I love that video you shared that was amazing I am so glad that it worked yeah. um, I was like I'm gonna unshare and reshare just to make sure that the sound is gonna come through because I love their like description and stuff and that'd be yeah that would be sad to miss out on that um, definitely but do uh, we have questions we do have many questions and if you guys have questions feel free to put them in the q a box um but let's go through some of them um kind of earlier in your present oh okay uh first question is can you please give an example of a reptilian pollinator so i've got to do more research on that but apparently in in a lot of tropical places like madagascar in africa and actually, um, in South America, there are examples of reptiles that actually drink nectar. And so they visit flowers to drink nectar. And as they're going from plant to plant, they're also carrying a bunch of pollen on their bodies. There's actually a specific one. I, I literally just looked it up, but there's like this lizard. Hold on. Let me see if I can talk about it. So. There's um, the Naranca skink found in Brazil, drinks the nectar found in the flowers of the leguminous malunga tree. And this tree blooms during the dry season and the flowers secrete nectar, which I guess is a, also a source of water for the skink. Oh. So they go from tree to tree and they do that. I will say like, Anything can be a pollinator, but there's like different levels to being a pollinator. They're like the real specialists, like the bees, because um, they gather pollen, they use pollen. And then there are others that are kind of more incidental. They're kind of there for the party. I mean, you know those folks. There's like 
<laughs> buzzing bees of the party yeah. who like get around and there's the other ones who are like oh, i'm just here to hang out and that's fine too um right. so yeah there is a good cool. question yeah and then someone asked what kind of bee beetles are we seeing in the mariposa lily um there was a photo like towards the beginning of your presentation of a yellow mariposa lily with a bunch of beetles in it that was when this question was asked oh my gosh i have no idea <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> i yeah. I tried, I really tried to look it up and I'm like, I am not, as I mentioned, I'm not an entomologist, um, and, but I do know an entomologist, uh, Marav, so maybe I'll ask her. Um, but I remember looking at certain beetles and uh, looking on iNaturalist <laughs> just to see if the AI could come up with an, like, a response. And it was like, um, sap beetle or... <laughs> And I'm like, that's not descriptive enough. Yeah. I'm sorry. So just be be humbled by the fact that there are like many, many, many species of beetles in the world. Like we don't even know mm -hmm. how many species of beetles there are in the world. They're just immense. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm okay with not necessarily knowing. Um <laughs> I, I know so many of those complexity. Yeah. So many of those look so closely together. Yeah, it would really take like an expert to tell you the difference and be like, the hairs on the legs are growing. And I was like, oh, they're, cool. They're, yeah. They're, glow they're growing up instead of down. Oh, and that's what yeah. makes it this kind of beetle, you know? And some actually, uh, in entomology, a lot of people actually have to dissect the insect in order to ID it, mm -hmm. in order to look at their sex organs, because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that separates them from another species. Very good question though. I mm -hmm. will try to find out. Um, but no, I, I know that it is a heavy task. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question was, do you know how the population of bay checker spot butterflies are doing in Coyote Valley this year? A couple weeks ago, um, the question asker saw tiny plantains along the Serpentine Trail in Edgewood Park in Redwood City. Could those be dwarf plantains? They very possibly could be dwarf plantain um, to answer that second question. And the first question, um, on Coyote Ridge, um, I heard um, on the landfill, landfill property, I think, and the water district property, they're doing pretty well. They aren't necessarily doing as great this year on other properties, which is something really bizarre. But you know, these populations of butterflies, they fluctuate from year to year, and it's totally dependent on multitude of factors, including rainfall, including how well the area is grazed, including how many areas of solar exposure. It's really dependent on also the slope of the hills um, and how many areas, you know, it's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. So just remember that with insect populations in general just because you see a dip in the population doesn't necessarily mean that they're absolutely gone forever but we should be concerned and definitely work towards improving that habitat but yeah it's Stu Weiss would have a better answer than me um we I think we have another presentation that's been recorded that Stu Weiss actually talks a lot more in depth about that but they're doing all right in other parts of the ridge and um, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah. Uh, another question is where can we find bee flies? Bee flies, um, just about anywhere. Um, anywhere where you have native plants. Um, so like in the Santa Clara Valley or like the, the Bay Clara Area. Okay. Yeah, all, all of the pictures of different flies and insects and stuff were actually from volunteers and people on iNaturalist here in this area so and and I'm when I say here I mean basically the South Bay mm -hmm. uh that's South Bay Valley basically so you have a pretty good chance of looking for those and finding them just look at your local native plant gardens your local open spaces they'll be good and last question, do you know how far a native bee will fly to find a food source? I'm not sure. And it really depends on the on the species. Um, 
there are some species I'm sure that will travel a bit further than others. Um, there's actually like uh, some really crazy, like very niche, tiny native bees. They, they, they almost look like gnats um, to our human eye because they're so small. But their, their whole territory is like this little patch of sand mats that's um, literally two feet by two feet. Um, they don't go mm -hmm. that far. Um, and, and that's another reason why protecting pollinator habitat is so important is it's so there's such a diversity and so many different niches for these organisms that, um, you know, if you haphazardly, you know, start developing certain areas without considering that, you could lose so much. Um, Another resource that I would highly recommend looking into is um, there's a, a, a community scientist, her name is Crystal Hickman, and her uh, her handle on Instagram and her website is bsip, B-E-E-S-I-P um, dot com. And um, she's been documenting all of these really rare and um, beautiful native bees in California and she identified like one of these really tiny ones for example and it's like yeah like how are you, how are you supposed to know unless you just pay attention mm -hmm. unless you care enough to just look at it um so I, I would highly recommend looking into her stuff and also I can I can share a list of books if people are interested too mm -hmm. after this but yeah we can yeah. definitely send a follow-up email with a bunch of resources and yeah, yeah that'd be so awesome. hopefully I get to see some of you at Marshall Cottle. Um, we're gonna have a booth there and have some activities, so that should be really fun. Um, awesome. we're, we're on time. So we're on time. I love it. Uh, if y'all have any other questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, you can find my email on the website and also on this presentation, and we'll be sure to send out a follow up. Um, with resources if you're interested. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.